Many are familiar with the term the Big Three, that being One Piece, Naruto, and Bleach. As a group, they helped further establish and elevate anime and manga into a household fad. The number of series that they helped influence and will continue to influence for the years to come is almost immeasurable. Since the conclusion of Naruto in 2014 and Bleach in 2016, I'm sure thousands have been conspiring what will be the next Big Three. However, in my eyes, the Big Three is irreplaceable, and that's due to many reasons. Reasons that we will discuss in a future video. In order to discuss the significance and permanent position of the Big Three, we must first discuss those who were involved in the creation of these three series. As Taito Kubo has been the quietest of the Big Three creators, it's only appropriate that we discuss his career and significance first. For today, let's try and get a whopping three likes on this video. If you have any mangaka you'd like me to highlight in the future, then please feel free to comment below. With that being said, let's get started. Taito Kubo was born on June 26, 1977, in Hiroshima Prefecture. His father worked a rather ordinary job, being a council member of the city. As a child, Kubo was fascinated in architecture and design, and in elementary school, he was definite on becoming a manga artist. Kubo has said on numerous occasions that his biggest influences were Shigeru Mizuki, creator of Gegege no Kitaro, and Masami Kuramata, creator of Saint Seiya. Despite determining his profession at a young age, it wouldn't be until his third year in high school where he would begin to write. In an interview done in 2006 with Weekly Shonen Jump, Kubo states, I didn't have any experience or knowledge on how to draw manga. I didn't know you were supposed to draw rough pages first, so I just drew directly on paper and submitted it to Weekly Shonen Jump for a contest. I didn't win, but I got a phone call from one of the editors who suggested we work together. This seems to be a common tale for many mangaka. With no clear guidance on how to become a manga artist, most just submit rough material, hoping for feedback. As one would guess, that call Kubo received ended up working out in his favor. By the age of 19, Kubo would release his first of three one-shots that he had written during the 90s, titled Ultra Unholy Hearted Machine, in Weekly Shonen Jump's magazine, produced by Suesha. The cover page would display the back of a shirtless man with the words love, expose, delete carved into his back. With being a debut piece, the one shot didn't showcase Kubo's signature angular artwork and which he'd later be known for. However, it was able to reveal that there was potential. With our story following two characters, Beinhardt Rosner and his partner Tina Tina. Together, the two would work as the leaders with the purpose of making people and buildings just vanish. Even now, when looking at this one-shot, I'm still left amazed that this was Kubo's debut piece. While it's nothing spectacular, Kubo at the time had barely any experience, yet he still managed to tell an interesting story. I think Kubo was successful in showcasing his talent for that time. It's definitely something I recommend, especially to those who love Bleach and support Kubo. It's also noteworthy to mention that Ichido Oda debuted Romance Dawn in the same issue. In a quick turnaround, Kubo would release another one-shot in that same year, titled Rune Master Udana. Once again, this would be printed in Weekly Shonen Jump, produced by Shueisha. Rune Master Udana is definitely an improvement to Kubo's debut piece, as both the story and artwork do see an upturn. Our story this time follows Udana, a young girl who clashes with many demons and hopes to defeat her. With the powers of her tattoos, Udana is able to defeat and bind them to her body, thus using them for future battles. While the one-shot does possess a straightforward story, it was told fairly well. It's also the first time we really see Kubo begin to identify himself as an artist, but despite its improvements to Kubo's original work, it's still my least favorite of Kubo's early trilogy of one-shots. Kubo's final one-shot during this decade came in the year of 1997, titled Bad Shield United. Bad Shield United is a science fiction based series that follows partners Ricky and Millie, members of S2C, an organization whose purpose is to repossess combat androids known as Shields. The two are set out on a mission to capture the lover of a terrorist leader and attempt to prevent any serious incidents. While successful in seizing their target, Ricky and Millie must find out a new way to terminate their enemy as he's upgraded his arsenal. Now, it's transparent that this one shot was the original groundworks to both Kubo's long running series which we will discuss later on, but overall I felt that this one shot was Kubo's strongest and most enjoyable. I do believe that it could have been expanded to around 25 chapters though. 
Following the release of Kubo's three one-shots, he would release his first ongoing series titled Zombie Powder. Zombie Powder would begin on July 19, 1999 and continue until its abrupt ending on February 15, 2000. During its production, Kubo had the assistance from his editor, as well as five assistants, however, the roles of his staff were never specified. The story follows powder hunters Gamma and Elwood, who are seeking out a mythical set of rings known as the Twelve Rings of the Dead, jewelry that is claimed to grant life to those who are in possession of. Over time, these rings accumulated large amounts of zombie powder, and once all twelve are brought together, one can extract the highly sought after powder to use for their own desires. The powder itself can grant many abilities, such as limitless life force, eternal life, and resurrecting the dead. These are the only three that are mentioned within the series, however, I believe that there could be other capabilities that the powder possessed if the series had continued. Zombie Powder initially begins with a high-paced, attention-grabbing opening, with our two protagonists befriending one another after Elwood fails to rob Gamma. The two would be spotted together by Elwood's local gang, who Elwood is affiliated with at the time. In a belief that Elwood would turn in Gamma and collect his reward money for himself, the gang raids Elwood's house, killing his sister in the process. After being rescued by Ganma, Elwood would accompany him in hopes of resurrecting his sister with the Twelve Rings of the Dead. Along the way, our cast joins forces with others, both past connections and newly met individuals who share similar goals. Their quest for the rings, however, would have many obstacles in their way, one of those being Kubo's inexperience as a manga artist. Zombie Powder's atmosphere and setting are very similar to Trigun by Yasuhiro Naitao, which also happens to be my favorite series of all time, so you should check that out if you haven't already. Despite a fast start, the series never seemed to find a proper pacing, with three of the four volumes focusing on the third ring alone. Within the 27 chapters, very little information about our cast and their abilities are ever revealed. This left me with a huge question mark during many battles. Part of me believes Kubo wanted to hold this information for bigger storylines later on, but part of me also believes this was a young manga artist struggling to write his first long-running series. My biggest issue with Zombie Powder comes from Kubo's artwork. I felt as if Kubo missed an opportunity to add more detail in some vital areas. With Zombie Powder's setting being a flat landscape, Kubo should have taken a stronger approach with character details and action scenes. While providing clean artwork, it just felt plain. It goes without saying that the series was a flop in Japan. However, because of Bleach and its large fan base, Zombie Powder will receive a nice cult following within the United States. Reflecting on the series 12 years after its conclusion, Kubo would discuss issues he had with schedules and due dates. Kubo also seemed to have little confidence in his abilities at the time, as he focused more on his editor's comments than his own ideas. It's always interesting to see these incredibly successful manga creators and their beginnings. It should be mentioned that Kubo's early one-shots can be found in volumes 2, 3, and 4 of Zombie Powder. They're relatively inexpensive, so if you can, pick them up. Overall, Zombie Powder was definitely fun to read. Apart from his flaws, most of which come from a young writer with little experience, I did enjoy it. Being that it never saw a true conclusion, I wouldn't mind Kubo returning to this work at some point. However, there doesn't seem to be any desire on Kubo's end to do this. A year and a half after Zombie Powder's conclusion, Kubo would debut his most prolific series thus far in his career, known as Bleach. As stated in the intro of this video, Bleach was part of the Big Three and is frequently mentioned as a gateway series for many. Bleach would run from August 7, 2001 to August 22, 2016, spanning over 700 chapters and 74 volumes. At the time this video is being made, Bleach has sold approximately 120 million volumes worldwide, an incredible number. With the addition to its volume sales, Bleach would be awarded Shogakukan's 50th Manga Award in 2005. With its abundance of adaptations, even those who didn't actively read the series have most likely been exposed to it through its anime adaptation, the video games, light novels, musicals, data books, feature-length films, or as of recent, its live-action movie adaptation. Yeah, Bleach was quite in demand during its run. The premise of Bleach is quite simple, yet expands into a convoluted mess that sometimes spiraled way out of control. The overall premise of Bleach traces high schooler Ichigo Kunisaki and his journey on becoming a soul reaper. 
Bleach's early chapters can be viewed as a stereotypical, cliched story, however, I enjoyed them quite a bit. I did find it amusing to watch Ichigo struggle learning the role of a Soul Reaper. The action was clean and well animated, and Kubo revealed just enough detail about Bleach's power system to keep me reading for more information. Bleach also opened up with some great character chemistry. Kubo's early work of Bleach was some of my favorite, as he had a clear approach and understood how to set up for something more significant. And so, despite its very shonen-esque approach, Kubo's fun writing attitude created a great introduction leading into the general outline of its first arc. The cliché start might turn some off, but Kubo utilized those details into creating what many argued to be the greatest arc of all time, known as the Soul Society arc. Kubo's Soul Society arc flaunted his strong understanding on changing pace, while also showing his patience towards a big reveal, elements we never witnessed during his earlier works. Kubo created a devoted fanbase through his combined efforts of meticulous writing and merging that together with an enlivening cast, and with that, it appeared Kubo was in sync with Bleach itself. The Soul Society arc displayed great traits that helped it stand out in an industry full of so many up-and-coming series. Kubo's writing dexterity helped Bleach become this action-filled series with distinctive abilities, all while managing to successfully tell a continuous story that grasped the attention of its audience. And when the time came, Kubo understood when to add development and deceitfully twist the story. It's clear why so many viewed the Soul Society arc with high regards, as it's well deserved. Fans were able to see a highly motivated young manga artist trying to make the most of his new opportunity. And with Bleach's early success, several interview requests were in demand with the artist. However, these interviews don't contain significant information as they more so cover character commentary or information we already covered earlier. Both Kubo's and Bleach's momentum will continue, as yet another solid arc was compiled. Bleach's second arc, known as the Arankar arc, would again demonstrate several redeeming qualities of Kubo's writing. And personally speaking, the Arankar arc is my favorite of Bleach, but you didn't care, did you? The Arankar arc would help validate Kubo as a genuinely gifted creator. In parallel to its predecessor arc, Kubo's resourcefulness assisted in retaining fan interest. Kubo managed to mask the recycled storyline through several new additions, most notably the new cast. The new cast additions had a strong visual appeal to them with distinctive details. They boasted enticing personas and created an even stronger interest. Existing characters were given significant depth, maintaining relevance as fans fell in love with the newer, electrifying cast. Kubo again appeared to be in sync with Bleach, as at this time, Kubo's attention to detail was at its finest. The confidence in Kubo's writing ability had flourished and layered the arc even further. This confidence would cause a small stir on occasions, however, as on scarce occasions, Kubo would add unnecessary character details that really weren't necessary. Despite this, I'd rather see an attempt than nothing at all, so this gets a pass by me. Few could argue about the issues with pacing, and I understand to an extent. Despite putting together two very well put together arcs, the Arankar arc is when Kubo's flaws as a writer start to become more noticeable, most notably being his attention to detail, which would have a more significant role during Bleach's second half. It's important to note that every viewer has a different experience when observing something. Those who experience the series by different formats will definitely enjoy Bleach contrarily, especially during this arc. In an interview with Shonen Jump during the Arankar arc being animated, Kubo states, I think what's fun in the anime and what's fun in the manga are two different things. What's fun to see in the anime is, of course, the way things move and sound. What I recommend most is to read the manga first, then watch the anime. You'll discover and enjoy how a particular scene in the manga is transformed and how the action is portrayed. Some things in the manga have evolved into something new or have been shown in a way that only the anime can achieve. These are the things that I hope readers will enjoy most when watching the anime. Bleach's latter half can be viewed as the biggest downfall of any long-running shonen series. Not only does Bleach go down a downward spiral, but Kubo himself appears to self-implode during this time. Starting off with the Fullbring arc, which is unanimously Bleach's worst arc, Kubo's all-embracing writing fashion was non-existing during this time. Kubo would make a ballsy move by shifting focus onto other characters during this point in the story, a move that would backfire significantly. 
In result, Kubo would expose his difficulty working under pressure and ultimately hurting the story more. On many occasions, Kubo would find himself backed into a corner, oftentimes writing an inconsistent chapter. It does seem that Kubo was aware of his mistakes early on, however, he would have to dig another hole just to get out of the hole that he already dug. It felt as if Kubo took a mental leave of absence during this period of Bleach, as nothing reached the same standards from the earlier arcs. The significant dip in quality would see its fast-paced battles become lackluster. Its once exciting cast seemed nothing more than high school outcasts now, and as the story progressed, Kubo would find difficulty developing existing cast members, something that he had successfully accomplished twice by this point. Fan frustration grew as Kubo's audience became impatient, as they had been spoiled by two great arcs previously. The energy and creativeness that Kubo once showcased was no longer present, and in result consistently created several sloppy chapters. It would appear at this moment that the spark both Bleach and Kubo created substantially dimmed, and fans were left worried for the future. The Fulbring arc would end in under 70 chapters, being severely rushed. Several rumors surround Kubo's career during this time, with claims shown in Jump forced an early entry, or his health was bad. There's also others that state that Kubo just wanted out. I'm undecided on what actually happened, as Kubo wrote 423 chapters of quality work before this. At this time, however, both parties have never confirmed what really happened with the Fulbring arc. The Fulbring arc would also be the last canon-related material of Bleach to be animated. The anime had a total of 366 episodes, which is quite a long run. It's true that at the time of its cancellation, there was no current Bleach material to be animated, and that is likely the reason why for its cancellation, but I'm also sure Shonen Jump and the studios that were animating it had little confidence in Bleach's next arc, deciding to pull the plug entirely. Kubo would revitalize Bleach to an extent with its final arc. Known as the Thousand Year Blood War arc, it's clear that Kubo worked hard not to recreate the same disaster that was the Fulbring arc. The arc, however, is still considered a mixed bag, as several issues that Kubo presented previously were still present in his writing. Despite this, Kubo reluctantly had envisioned Bleach's finale years in advance, helping the story feel more concise and complete. Kubo did seem determined to right his wrongs throughout the arc. This motivation would help him establish another enjoyable cast, while also reinstating several fan favorites, which I personally really enjoyed. However, Kubo would again fail to appropriately introduce these characters' abilities, often overpowering them and leaving some existing cast members to appear lost. In result, there were several unclimactic battles, making some victories feel undeserved or just ending for the sake of the plot. Kubo would attempt to recycle bits and pieces from previous arcs, oftentimes succeeding, which I found amusing. Kubo's early envisions of Bleach's finale definitely helped him build a fairly strong and engaging story. Once more though, we saw Kubo's severe attentiveness to detail impact the story in a negative manner. The amount of over-detail would remove a lot of true significance as the story became too confusing or convoluted. At points the story would drag, and there were some battles that lasted for over 5 months, which is ridiculous. Despite the flaws, his motivation would definitely help the arc for the better. It's easy to handpick what's missing or what went wrong with the arc, but I still found it entertaining. While not thoroughly as enjoyable as Kubo's early work of Bleach, it's still worth checking out and even rereading at some point. In my eyes, the latter half of Bleach was evidence that Kubo's not fitted as a long-term creator, but would flourish with a medium-length series. After the first half, Kubo failed to expand clearly, instead opting for his excessive use of detail to distract the audience from his lack of ideas. From a creator's perspective, there's nothing wrong with hitting a roadblock, but as a professional, Kubo should have requested a hiatus to ensure a solid story. Despite the downfall Bleach encountered, its conclusion would leave a big void in the industry. As much as it was flawed, Bleach and Kubo were loved and endured by millions on a weekly basis. And even to this day, I don't get the same excitement I once did when checking out weekly releases. For me, nostalgia might be playing a factor, but Kubo and Bleach's dynamism has yet to be mimicked. Kubo and Bleach had a significant impact on the industry, but while it was sad to see it end, it was time for the next generation to take over. In an interview with TBS Radio, Kubo would have a very productive conversation about Bleach and his history. During the interview, Kubo does acknowledge Bleach's inconsistencies, mentioning that Bleach at times was on autopilot. 
What's interesting to point out is that this doesn't seem to bother him in any way, and he mentions other highly flawed series that are praised to this day. Kubo would also mention that it was his decision to end Bleach, not his editors. Other interesting topics such as his illnesses and health during the series do come into discussion, as well as some matters regarding his personal life. I'm not going to cover all of the interview in this video, so if you're interested, there's a link in the description below. Both audio and text are available. Since the conclusion of Bleach, Kubo has only released one series, a one-shot titled Burn the Witch. Burn the Witch, in my opinion, is nothing more than a bland rehash of Bleach, with the story and characters feeling nearly identical to what Kubo had just concluded two years ago. The story takes place in London, with our protagonist Noel, a dragon slayer. Before reporting in for duty, Noelle is greeted by her local perv, who only wishes to see her panties. Upon arriving, Noelle and her partner Nini are assigned on a mundane task. After reaching their destination, Noelle and Nini receive an urgent phone call requesting their assistance in Noelle's hometown. The two would be asked to fight against the enormously powerful Dark Dragon and, of course, protect the local perv. The two would be victorious, however, due to the dragon touching the perv, he has now become part dragon somehow. So, as a result, he's signed under their care. And that's how the one-shot really ends. It's nothing that really impressed me, and I felt that it was just lackluster altogether. Despite me personally despising this one-shot, I feel that Kubo had good intentions. It felt more as a thank you to supporters for the last 15 years of support. However, an original one-shot with an original stories and characters would have made my support feel much more appreciated especially after two years since Bleach's conclusion. From my perspective, I just felt that Kubo put in 50% to collect the check and then went home. And in the end, I would have much rather he not made this at all. Despite Kubo's last hiccup, from my eyes at least, the man has gone and had an incredible career. Not only has he accomplished an incredible amount of accolades, but he's inspired countless manga artists and series that have gone and done the same thing. As a longtime fan of anime and manga, I would love to see Kubo return to the industry, especially reworking on Zombie Powder at some point. However, Kubo hasn't shown any interest in starting a new series or even releasing another one-shot at this moment. It seems he wants to focus on his mental and physical health before taking any serious commitments. That's something I understand and respect entirely. All in all, without Taito Kubo and Bleach, it's difficult to say if there would ever be the big three that helped revolutionize Japanese animation globally, all while forming it into a collective interest. And for that, I thank Taito Kubo and congratulate him on a successful career thus far. Hey, thank you for watching and sticking to the end. Here are a few other videos that I made. If you're interested, check them out. Also, if you have any other manga artists you'd like me to cover, leave a comment down below. Until next time.